Welcome everyone to another edition of Stand Alone, where we interview the best of the best to get every part of our lives in really good working order. How do we go from being ordinary to extraordinary? You know, it's not, um, when you are looking to get yourself to be at peak optimal levels, um, you have to realize how important relationships are in your life. And so as we dive into these topics, I wanted to bring experts to you that really understand the importance, have had personal experience with it, have outreach to other experts in the field. And today we are blessed to have Andrea Miller in our presence. She is the CEO and founder of Your Tango. So we're going to go into that. Um, you also have a podcast called Open Relationships, where you're just on this mission to transform people's relationships. And it's all coming from a place of love. It's not coming from this place of, you know, speaking ill of other people and women and men defend yourselves against mm -hmm. like, you know, whatever's going on out there. So I really like that. And so welcome for being here. Uh, thank you for your time, for you spending the time with us today. And, you know, for our audience, uh, make an investment in your relationships, because we all know that we don't live by ourselves. We have to learn how to live with one another and the better quality of relationships that we have, it's going to directly impact the quality of the life that we're living. So welcome, Andrea. I wanted to ask you, you know, what is your background for the audience um, and what made you, uh, you know, then go into, I know you also wrote a book called Radical Acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and in there, you discuss a little bit of your background where you were studying business and you had, I think, an engineering background. Mm -hmm. What made you get into a deep dive into relationships and the importance of that in our lives? Yeah, I I love to share it all, but I just want to give you huge props, Sabrina. It's been so fun getting to know you through your social feeds and what you're doing and your your courage and uh, uh if you will, re strong rebellious spirit is oh. inspiring, right? And as a some people strong, like it, some people not too much. <laughs> well, that I mean, listen, but that just what what you're doing and the the courage that that you're showing is inspiring to female leaders like me and probably. Um, both male and female leaders alike. So thank you for Love it. Thank having you. me on your show. And so the, I fell into relationships as a career really accidentally. As you said, my background was, I had a uh, background in engineering and finance. Uh, if anybody remembers that company Enron uh, from the 90s, oh, wow. um, I'm ex-Enron. I like to say I worked in the international group where we had real assets and and none of my team went to jail. And that was really fertile ground. I mean, talk about, you know, leadership and grit and courage and all those good things. I was uh, early on in my career, I got a, a front row seat to, to learn a ton and I loved it. And it was so entrepreneurial. I was based in India working on a $5 billion um, energy infrastructure project and I loved it, but I just felt like, I don't know that this is for me. And so I went, I always wanted to live in New York. So I, I, left Enron, went to Columbia Business School, and it was there that I, I really fell into my passion. I was sitting there in a class one day, and as I was thinking about the, and I became the managing editor of our school newspaper, and I'd never done anything in publishing, when I thought about the crowded media landscape, and I thought, oh my gosh, um, there is so much out, out there 59 ways to please your, please your man, 17 tricky ways to get him to propose to you, just lose 10 pounds and you'll be happy. That's what has dominated so much content, particularly for women, for so long. It's what I would say, it, it's almost predatory, right? It really preys on our insecurities and makes us feel worse about ourselves. So we go and buy more shit. And I said, uh, none of that content really ever appealed to me. But what is endlessly interesting and important and challenging and triumphant and everything in between can come back again and again to love and relationships. And it was just as an outsider of the publishing industry, I had, you know, from my own young life, I looked at that and said, there's a there's a lot of white space there. So I started Your Tango, is the publishing business that I run that we attract many, you know, 15 million people um, to the site each and every month with all of our partnerships and social. We're reaching about 40, 50 million people each and every month with our content. And wow. it just comes back to the central um, uh, truth about how critically important relationships are in our lives. And I feel like 
a lot of that is taken for granted. In fact, I'm reading um, Howard Schultz's book right now, uh, Pour Your Heart Into It, I think it's called. And before him, most people were satisfied drinking, you know, dishwater coffee. And he brought espresso to America, you know, to the masses. And now a, a lot of people, most people have a have a higher expectation, you know, in their lives for their coffee. And I, I liken that to relationships because I think a lot of us are drinking dishwater coffee in our relationships. Like, oh yeah, we got it. But are we thriving? Uh, no, we're not thriving. And the loneliness epidemic, those details um, uh, tell a really horrific story. Um, I mean, the, the physical costs, the um, uh, mental and emotional costs that people are, are, are paying and just the quality of our lives are, I would say, um, not nearly what they can be. And that's from somebody who did it wrong a lot. And now, you know, mostly have crossed the Rubicon. I'm not perfect. I'm, you know, I'm still on a journey myself, but it's also why the name of my podcast is Open Relationships, colon, Transforming Together. I, I read a lot of self-help books and I love to learn. But when I think about self-help books and, you know, listening to shows and, and watching stuff, it's like you're in a lab and that's great, right? You can learn from a lab. But when I think about applying what you learn in the lab, that's in the real world, that's in our relationships, that's when it's hard, but but that's also where the transformation occurs. So yeah, so I went from engineering and finance to a very passionate advocate and media for better relationships. Yeah, I think the best people um, that you know, do well in their fields. We have different backgrounds. Like I come from a science background, then I applied mm -hmm. science to business and it allowed mm -hmm. me to like see things from a different lens instead of just like this only one way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, cross pollination is a beautiful thing, but I mm -hmm. love um, in your book, you also mentioned like they did a $20 million Harvard study for 75 years, right? Mm -hmm. You're thinking they're going to come up with this like most profound thing ever. And what they found mm -hmm. is that love is happiness and you know what, and then full stop. And mm -hmm. I love this. If you can talk about this, because what is true stands the test of time and we are human beings and love is a very important thing for us, but it's really hard for us to articulate what that means like, what does that really feel like um, in your book? You, you talk about like when you are having like a difficult time with your husband, you're thinking like, I can't live with you, but I can't live without you. And you're like, is this love? So walk us through that, like mm -hmm. to spend all that money to, to equate love is happiness. Does that mean that love is happiness all the time? And then why do we have to ha be constantly working on our relationship to get us back to that place? Yeah. Oh, thank you for teeing that up, uh, Sabrina. That is, it's like right there at the heart of my mission. And yes, you referenced the heart, the famous Harvard Grant study, and they've added to that with uh, a companion study called the Gluick study. And like you say, the the author of that uh, concluded his report by saying happiness is love, full stop. And, uh, you know, and you know, on top of that, they've continued to add to that body of data that talks about um, how the quality of our lives are 100% correlated with the quality of our relationships, um, and and even beyond Harvard. But but Harvard has done a really good job of popularizing the data that longevity, happiness, and wellness are all completely correlated to the quality of our relationships. In fact, I was reading something the other day about uh, older people going in and you know getting their medical care. And that one doctor they referenced said, hey, before I ask you about anything else, talk to me about your social life, right? And it's like, what? And so so the data from, you know, the the doctors, you know, the MDs to the PhDs, it's really, really apparent. And, and it's certainly true in my own life. I often talk about, and I say in the book, my husband, who for me was love at first sight, and he's the greatest guy in the world, except for when he isn't. And for us, it, it's been fireworks of the best and worst kind. And as I've been able to see my own blind spots, and as I've been able to be more honest and learn and grow, and ultimately the big aha that I've had with him in my marriage is I've learned to meet him where he is and our marriage is transformed. 
and we've always loved each other. But I think my experience describes the vast, vast majority of marriages. People love each other and they, they sincerely do care about each other, but they didn't necessarily grow up with parents as great role models. I mean, again, my parents have been together for over well, almost 60 years. They love each other a lot, but it was also fireworks of the best and worst kind. Yeah. I mean, mom and dad love you, but I think you would agree, not the best, you know, um, role models when it comes to how to create a thriving marriage. And I think then you add in our society, I mean, I love being an entrepreneur and I know you do too, Sabrina, but I, I feel like here, whether it's America, or I think Canada is pretty similar where it's like, it's so about the individual and what am I achieving and what do I want? And finding that that happy medium, I think is what I'm called to do. Um, and I think that's what everybody is, is called to do. But I think the other, just to completely answer your question, I think a lot of people, when I tell them I run a business on love and relationships, they either think it's a dating app or they think it's just about romantic love. And, um, and it's neither, it's, you know, yeah, we, we cover dating, we cover romantic love. But when I think about love in its truest form and um, having, whether it's um, somebody that's in your, your family or your spouse, that you really consider a friend, somebody you really love to spend time with and you can really confide in. When I think of friendship, I think love. I mean, I tell my friends I love them all the time. I, I tell my team I love them. I don't think that's politically correct. <laughs> but that oh, feeling great. of appreciation and care, I mean, the probably the best advice I've ever got since you, you know so much of your work is on leadership, it's the most obvious. And that is making sure my team knows how much I care about them. And I do. And we've got a kick-ass team that, you know, most of them have been with the company for a really long time and they care about each other. And that's the, that's the ethos. That's our culture. And so when I think about love, to me, love goes hand in hand with caring. I mean, it's easy to say, I love you. Um, show me, you know, show me through caring, show me through um, being patient with me and giving me grace and checking in on me. Right. And I, that's, you know, ultimately it's what I tell my, I've got two boys, 11 and 14. It's what I tell them literally 10 times a day. You get what you give. And so when I think about us wanting to be seen and heard and valued and, and cared for, you know, to me, that's, that's what is, is often lacking and not because people are bad. I, I think most people actually try really hard. They're stressed. They have too much to do. Right. You know, they're in challenging relationships. And so maybe rather than finding really constructive ways to improve those relationships, that, that kind of toxicity bubbles up. And rather than giving the kindness and the grace and the care, instead you're giving the, you know, the cold shoulder, the folded arms, the rolled eyes. And then we wonder, you know, why is that what we're experiencing? Right. And, you know, so for me, it goes full circle with that Grant and Gluick um, study, those studies from Harvard there, they just, they dug in and, and just add a little more color to that. I think you're right that the, the authors and the researchers expected a different outcome, right. And they, they controlled for success and health and achievement and, um, um, you know, fame and status and income. It's like they looked at all that stuff. And, you know, to me, it's really heartening to say, you know what, it's all right here. It is all here in, you know, inside each of us to, you know, to achieve um, the key to happiness, you know, which like this, the study says, it's about love. But, you know, I'm going to say the most obvious thing in the world. I said it a few minutes ago, you get what you give. So I always advocate my, you know, my team, my kids, myself, my husband, everybody that I, you know, is willing to listen to me. Hey, you go first, right? I feel like so often we're waiting for the other person to go first. Give me the love, you know, give me the grace and, and patience, right? That's what we want. But it, it typically doesn't work like that. I so agree. Uh, I was thinking about this yesterday. This really fell into like my spirit really hard. You know, what would you say is the role of commitment in love? Because for a lot of people today, like what you were saying, I think generally in North America, it's such an individualistic society mm -hmm. 
that if something doesn't please us in the moment, we are like on to the next so fast at such a rapid fire rate. And that's true for our careers. That's why a lot of people don't give it time to nurture. And for a lot of us, you know, we often sacrifice our relationships for our careers, but could it be that we have commitment issues, period, where we just don't know how to like stay put, <laughs> work mm-hmm. through something and then get to the, to, to the end, but then do the work. I'm not saying like, just stay there and it's all going to work out, but what is your feeling about commitment? Because I think that's a, that's a huge part of it for me when I see people in careers and I see relationships, what, what is your findings on the role of commitment? Yeah. I'm going to answer like this. I think it's a great question. The grass is greener where you water it. Right. And I I feel like so many people think the grass is greener on the other side. So I'm going to bail on commitment because it's better there. He's better. She's better. You know, this other job is better. And it's like, that's, that's not how it works. Maybe every now and then, maybe every now and then. But for the most part, when I think about in my own life, in the business that I've built and in so many other successful careers, very rarely is there an overnight success. I mean, Sabrina, you know that, right? So often that overnight success is built minimally a decade, often a lot more. And then suddenly it comes, you know, burgeoning through, you know, whether it's building a social media presence where like you, you know, you've built this beautiful audience of people that love you, but you didn't do it quickly. I mean, it, it, it takes time, right? And so I think we are in a society that is um, so used to instant gratification. And I, I think it's really hurting us, right? From bailing too soon on um, on a relationship to bailing too soon on ourselves to bailing too soon on our career, where it's like, hey, give it a little bit, give it, give it some time, nurture it. I mean, I'm a gardener. So when I, you know, I'm looking out into my garden, it's a little uh, snowy here in Colorado, but it'll be, you know, blossoming before too long. And I just think if it was like, God dang it, I wish those roses would grow faster. You know, I'm freaking bailing on the roses. It's like, that's not how it works. And so I just think there's kind of an instant gratification, kind of an immaturity that has infected a lot of us. And, you know, when I think about my work, I often talk about, I've had to grow up more emotionally, Right. And that, I mean, it, it takes that wisdom and it takes falling down and making mistakes and having your heart broken. And then finally you go, well, you know, that's not working. And so I just, I do urge people that, that, and especially if they're flitting, flitting, flitting to say, okay, you know, what's common in this equation, probably it's me. And when I, when I interview people that have uh, moved around a ton, that's a big red flag. Yeah, Totally. Um, you know, one of the things that I look, uh, I'm in the insurance space and a lot of times we're always thinking about things that affect, you know, the body for our health, for our risk, Mm -hmm. but I I, I'm predicting that there's going to be a large emphasis on like mental health in the future that will, Mm -hmm. will affect insurance. And, you know, I really do think like, what is the correlation between our mental health and our quality of relationships? You know, when you think about a mental health crisis, that's going to brew, um, what is that relative to a relationship crisis that you talk about? And why is it so important for us to fix these relationships that are in our lives so that we don't have this or we can prevent this mental health crisis. Is there a correlation? What would you speak on? Oh, you nailed it, sister. I mean, loneliness epidemic, mental health crisis, it is not at all, even kind of in my mind, um, an accident that those are raging simultaneously. I actually put it under the broader umbrella of of a relationship crisis. Um, On my show, I've uh, had the great gift of being uh, close friends with Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt, you know, they're the OGs of Imago therapy and, you know, some of Oprah's favorites and so forth. And so they came onto my show early on and Helen reminded me and our guests that it's like trauma starts in relationship, right? From neglect, from abuse, um, addiction, like you name all those things that have gone, that have occurred in the generations before us, that is what is causing us 
you know, as well-intentioned adults, that, that trauma that we experienced in these important relationships in our lives, again, whether it's the, the trauma of neglect, the trauma of abuse, the, you know, lot, lots of these things, it, it can only be repaired in relationship. And so when I think about the inextricable link between the loneliness epidemic, the mental health crisis, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear you as a pioneer in the insurance business is thinking about it like that, because it, it does feel like there is a lot still a lot more room, A, for our, our society to be, you know, better educated on this. Um, and then certainly, you know, in the um, health and wellness industry, and I, I feel like there's mental health and mental health care has gotten a lot more attention and I'm grateful for it, but let's face it, there is still, it's like, we're in a society that is hurting. And so when I think about um, people improving their relationships and let's face it, there's an inextricable link between how I'm caring for myself and my ability, how I show up to my husband and how I show up to my kids and how I show up to my team. So those two and, you know, to me are very much inextricably linked, but I don't think, I don't think we, um, we can avoid the fact that unless we are able to spend more time in person, you know, I always, you know, like to wave my phone, you know, these weapons of mass distraction, uh, the fact that we can get uh, groceries without walking outside, we can get food without well, walking outside. I mean, there's so much in our society and, and a lot of that, those efficiencies aren't going to change right? Because it's really nice to have um, Amazon bring a book to me in a day and, and all those things. And I'm not going to the bookstore. I mean, I like to, but it just doesn't happen nearly like it used to. So I think there's the the gap to me is this, this becoming more aware of, yes, we have um, greater efficiency in our lives um, and, and, you know, so much entertainment and social media and all that stuff at our fingertips. And yes, we also need to learn how to balance that um, because the price that we're paying in terms of how disconnected we are as a society is literally killing us, right? I mean, it is worse to smoke two packs a day than it is to be lonely. And let's talk about, um, you know, people that are in solitary confinement when they're imprisoned and what happens to them, right? It is better to be, you know, beaten up by a prison guard and, and you know, abused by your cellmates than it is to be in solitary confinement. Like, what does that say, right? It's better to be in an abusive relationship than be alone. Yeah, so- I'm not advocating for abusive relationships, but just yeah. as like a call to arms to say, you know, this is serious, folks. Yeah, I think it's really important that we dive into this because even for myself, like I appreciate like space and time so I can do like deep work. Um, but I always understand that I do that deep work to then take it to people and society and then serve others. It's not like I want to do some deep work on myself to be like, okay, I'm a winner, but what am I winning if I'm not playing a game with other people? So you said it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's important. That, totally. And I feel like as leaders, it's even more incumbent upon us, like the Peter Parker's, uh, I think on said with great power comes great responsibility. And I think about that as a leader in my industry, that it, and as a mom, as a, you know, somebody in the community, as a daughter and all those roles that I play, I take the responsibility of, Hey, it is my job to do my own personal work so that I can show up and meet people where they are in a way that gives them courage. It's back to, you know, so often we foolishly wait for somebody else to be wise. We wait for somebody else to be courage, courageous. We wait for somebody else to go first. We can be waiting a long time. And so, yeah, I think leadership says, be the person that goes first, have the courage, do the work, be the person that is, you know, sincerely empathetic because that is a game changer. I mean, when I think one of the best things that, that, any other business leader can do for his or her company, it is really investing in helping their teams learn how to really care for each other. In fact, I'll share one quickie little anecdote. You may be familiar with this. A little like the Grant and Gluick study, Google, right? One of the, the biggest, most successful businesses in the world's history, spent a ton of money a handful of years ago trying to figure out what what is the combination or what is that secret formula to develop the best team, the most productive team? And, you know, for Google, I'm sure for every 
every person, it's like they're worth, you know, probably five, $10 million or, you know, some, some amount. So it, it matters that efficiency matters and productivity matters. What the, uh, what the study showed was it's not the smartest. And there are a lot of smart people at Google. It's not the people that necessarily like each other the best or have the most in common. It is the teams of people that feel the safest with each other. These are the people that give each other grace, that have you know patience. They can talk about crazy ideas. They can maybe fail and and not feel humiliated. Right? It's it's like it's like the Grant and Gluick study. I mean, duh. What you know? What makes the best team? Hey, we can trust each other. We got each other's backs, and it's not you know. And they probably don't hate each other, <laughs> right? So I just think about um, how this is one of the most. Um, rather maybe the biggest things that we can do as business leaders and in the other um, capacities that we serve, it's hidden in plain sight and it's show up and really nurture our relationships. And, you know, just going back to what you were asking about in terms of the commitment thing, I'm appalled how, how often people treat each other as disposable, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that, that's crazy. Right. And we're just, I feel like we're, you know, and, and especially for people that are really active in social media, how downright hostile and um, abusive, let's face it, uh, some of these social places can get. But I mean, I think we've all seen that, you know, rude to a waiter, hostile to your barista, you know, rude to your kid, you know, and, and by the way, I've been rude to my kid. I've been rude to people. I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but it's like, oh, Andrea, own that, apologize right? Do better. So I say all those things just because it it feels like we're in a society that um, that people are, are often just, it, when it comes to a stranger in particular, that they treat that person at, as a, um, as disposable. And same with a lot of corporate America, right? How often employees are treated as a cost center and it's like totally dehumanizing. So I, I think we just really need to bring the care and humanity back through better relationships and we'll see a transformation. And I think it's really important too to emphasize that a relationship is two people because a lot of times it's so easy to see like how a business is not is being rude to like the workers. But, you know, sometimes the workers are rude to a business. Like when when they invest into you and you're just like, I don't care, I don't need you. And it's like, Okay, well, mm -hmm. what happened to like the years that we've been working together? Same is true for the service industry. Like it's it's a relationship. I, I'm so service minded. So every time I go to just buy something, mm -hmm. you know, I'm nice, but is the person serving me nice to me? Like, mm -hmm. or are they like, I don't really care to ask how you're doing. Like I always look at how are you going above and beyond to nurture mm -hmm. this relationship and then to earn the customer's hard working you know, dollars. And I think it's so important when we talk about commitment and safety, because to me, it's not a safe place at work. Isn't a place where no one gets like their voices raised at, or like we, we do no wrong. It's the safety for me as a business to be able to tell you what I need to tell you for you to receive it. And to know that I'm not here to make you run away. You don't feel like you need to run away, but we have that relationship where it is safe that we can have disagreements. And isn't that the world that we live in today? We can't even dialogue with people that we disagree with anymore because there's just like no relationship at all. It's like, if, if I don't like you, I don't need to ever talk to you again. That's kind of how oh, we are. Totally. In fact, I did a show last week talking with a woman about the prevalence. There's a TikTok trend, but by the way, it's not just out there on TikTok. It's in our real lives, this whole idea of going no contact, Right. One of my team members told me that uh, with her parents who have a lot of adult children um, or, you know, parents, friends, I should say, excuse me, her parents, friends, between all of them, a ton of adult children. What she said to me is every single one of my parents, friends have an adult child that is estranged. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, what's up with that? Right. Um, and I. I believe it's unfortunate. I do believe there are extremes where that estrangement is warranted. Yeah. There's abuse. And, you know, I'm not here to say, hey, uh, you know, go back and 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 try to mend something that can't be mended because of the people involved. But I'm also here to say, 
I don't, I don't, I don't think the vast majority of the estrangement and the heartache is due to extremes. I think it's due to, I mean, unfortunately, I think it's a lot of ignorance. I think it's a lot of like self-protection. And so when I think about what you're saying, how, and especially when you add the um, political environment that has been ultra inflammatory uh, for the last nearly decade, I think it gets way, 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 way worse. And so I believe it's incumbent upon each of us sincerely to meet the others where they are. And I'm with you with the, with the rude person um, that's behind the counter. And what I, what I try to do when I'm at my best, it's like, Ooh, how can I show up and be sincere? And, you know, I'll say something like, especially I was at a Starbucks in Las Vegas recently and it was insane. And I'm like, wow, how are you doing? It is yeah. really busy in here. You, Everyone you, should work at okay? Starbucks for like one day and then they'll go back to their work and be like, I don't have it that bad. I know, totally. I watch them sometimes I'm like, you, they just don't stop. <laughs> they don't stop. And so when I think about what you're saying, Sabrina, that it's like, well, nobody seems to know how to talk to each other anymore. And again, I've I've been on the, the wrong side of it. And I, I say this all as as um, sort of authentically and honestly as I can, because I'm, I'm not holding myself up to be perfect or a saint, but I also know when I show up differently and I show up with compassion, it is, it's like instant karma. Um, even that grumpy person, a lot of the times it's like, they're not so grumpy, right? Yeah. And, you know, That's and I've tried, you, you get what you give, right? Mm -hmm. And if you just make them smile, they look at you different and then they like change. It's almost instantly. It is. It's that energy. It's that yeah. intention. And I, I found it with my team too. And, you know, as a younger, as a younger CEO, I mean, sorry to all those people that I wasn't, it wasn't better for you. You know, I tried, but I, I know for sure I didn't have the maturity, the wisdom or the self-confidence when um, things got stressful. And let's face it, it's easy to be nice and friendly when things are going well and you're making money and right. I mean, but that's to me, whether it's in a business or in a family or any other relationship, it's like, it's when things are stressful and hard, that's where the, the relationship becomes stressed. And yeah. when I think about the opportunity for each of us to then say, okay, it's now that I need to step up and give grace and um, be curious and empathetic and not, again, not wait for the other person to go first, and, you know, and when they, when other people screw up and they will, or when I, you know, back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, when I screw up and I do, it's like, oh crap, can I get a do-over? Can I just apologize for that? Right. And most people, I mean, my kids are, I, I feel like, so they're, um, they're so empathetic and, and mature in a lot of ways, because that's how we, we've really tried to raise them. Like when you screw up, you make the repair. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like otherwise we end up dehumanizing each other. It's like, they suck. They're an idiot. They're the problem. And there are some of those kinds of people, but I would say they're th that, that, um, propensity to say, to blame and say that person is, is just an asshole or an idiot. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't help us. Right. You know, it actually really hurts us as a society. Yeah. You know, for the audience that's listening, I think for a lot of people, you know, if there is an estrangement, I, I went through this and I can just say from, from going through it, it was a lot of immaturity and selfishness and on whose part on my part. Oh, hallelujah for being honest. Yeah, it was because it, it wasn't until I had children of my own that I realized like how selfish is that for a child to just remove themselves from their parent's life mm. when they did so much for you that you like, you know, when you're changing your child's diapers and it's mm. like, there's so much that went into that, that just kind of, mm -hmm. it goes so fast that you forget yeah. all the things that were done for you. But, you know, and and I don't even say it from a place of judgment because maybe I had to go through that to get mm -hmm. to where I was to like really value them and appreciate them. But I just wanted to say that because I think a lot of people, if you ever tell someone that it's immature and you call them immature, it is the worst possible. Oh, no, they're going to get mad. But, yeah. but there's a part of me that also says <laughs> using plain language and, and saying what it is. I mean, that takes courage too. Now I'm a big advocate of yes, telling the truth. And, and I say to my kids, say it so I can hear it. If you're screaming at me 
or, yeah. or being um, disrespectful, I'm not going to hear it. So, but I mean, ultimately when I, I feel like this idea of, Hey, if I'm, if I'm really being honest with myself, yeah. um, you said it, like if, if I'm honest with myself and I can say, yeah, I'm being immature right now, then I feel like that truth sets us free. And then we can say, Oh, okay. Yeah. Here's a chance to grow. But let me ask you this. Did you, um, have you reconciled with your yeah. family or wherever you were estranged? I have the best relationships in my life right now because mm -hmm. I've just, you know, through writing my book, I had, it was like so cathartic. Cause I had to like go mm -hmm. through all the things that I did. And then, you know, life is a beautiful thing. Like it just comes around at you full circle. And if you're paying attention, you know, you talk about it in your book, mm -hmm. like self-awareness. I think if you can just open your eyes and step outside of yourself and, and if, if you we're watching someone else do that. What would you say to them? And then like, start speaking to yourself that way. And just realizing like, first off, nobody has all the answers, but you can look at it from a different viewpoint. You can start to like, be more empathetic and understanding of what's actually happening instead of that short sightedness and selfishness, mm -hmm. which is when, when people are young, that's just running rampant. Like it's just a lot of selfish. Well, I think of it as playing the long game. Yeah. And uh, my husband's from India. And so he has a different perspective. He's in his early sixties and he describes, and they're, you know, a, a middle, you know, upper middle-class family that he describes when he was growing up, it's like to get a refrigerator, you had to know somebody. And yeah. so my husband is so good about um, making the time for people and building those relationships. And I, I feel like, you know, so many of us here in North America, um, in the West, it's like, you, you don't, you know, you, you just pay for it. Right. Yeah. And it yeah. becomes transactional versus relational. And I think that relational focus that is a little bit more common in Asia and, and some other societies in, in, you know, the North, uh, North America area too. But I feel like it's really easy to be transactional when you don't need to rely on anybody, but that's back to, okay, now we're in a mental health crisis and a loneliness epidemic because I don't need anybody. And now I'm, I'm freaking alone. Right. And I love your, your point about, um, you know, just your going back and, and kind of maybe doing that, that work and that introspection and, and appreciating, you know, that, that to me is playing the long game. And that, yeah. you know, I feel like that idea back to the, you know, commitment versus immaturity, it's like, we're here to play the long game. And if you play the long game, then maybe you can be a little more, um, uh, sort of generous with overlooking, you know, some, some people short shortcomings because you say, you know what, I, I'm not about winning the war or I'm not about winning the battle. And I, let's, and I don't like using that analogy, but it's like, let's play yeah. the long game. Yeah. And, and, you know, these relationships that stand the test of time. Wow. They, they pay us back in brilliant ways from longevity to joy to you name it. Yeah. I love traveling to Europe. And one of the reasons is you just see all these older couples together and it's like, it's just so nice. And I think that we should be reminded of that. Cause when you're on social media, you just see like all these people having a good time and you think like, why am I not having a good time right now? Mm -hmm. But like at the end goal, don't you want to have somebody later on that you can grow with and grow through things? I think that's what we have mm -hmm. to keep in mind. You know, in your book, you talk about um, like the, the five steps. And I love how you started off, uh, realizing when you were looking at your husband and saying certain things and someone just said to you, just love him mm -hmm. talk about that. Because I think if we can just get this very simple, like we are just over analyzing our relationships way too much, like mm -hmm. what we're comparing. And mm -hmm. I think we need to just, that's like very three simple, beautiful words. If you can mm -hmm. explain that, that would be yeah. wonderful. Here. Yeah, it is. It is simple and profound and even radical. And, and I feel like it's a way to take back our power, right? I feel like so often we just, we, we victimize ourselves. It's like, oh, it's all about the other person. It's like, mm -mm. we have way more power than we give ourselves credit for. And so when I think about this idea of just love him, it's, have that maturity and have that wisdom and play the long game uh, so that you can reap the benefits of that. Um, now, I mean, again, my husband and I have had a lot of challenges in our relationships and, and a lot of what is working better now is, is me having um, 
become wiser and more mature and, and, and understanding it's like, okay, where, you know, where he might make me, you know, feel a little crazy. It's like, you know, give him grace, Andrea. I mean, the, you know, back to the title of the book is radical acceptance. Um, and so it, for me, it's been very much doing my own work and so that I can meet him where he is. And that's where the magic happens, but it is, it's kind of back to what I was saying a few minutes ago. It's like doing, you know, sort of reading and learning about things in a vacuum or in a lab versus going out into the wild, going out into the world of relationships where, where it can be really challenging. And that, you know, to me, that is where, that is where the magic occurs. And so, yeah, I mean, I think this idea of just love him or just love her is a, is really profoundly important and empowering. I love um, the thing where you said um, about the long-term couples when they did those brain scans and they mm -hmm. um, shared like, what are the common things that all long-term couples have? Mm -hmm. And one of them, I just love this. It says that they have positive illusions. Mm -hmm. of oh, Helen Fisher. Yeah. I just love this. Can you explain that to people and why? It is so amazing to see your partner in the best light possible. Why would you be thinking anything less when people are like, you're delusional? I'm like, well, let me think that this person is this. Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. I mean, it's, uh, I love Helen Fisher. She's my soul sister and kindred spirit. She'll say, uh, like, overlook the bad and really notice the good. And now again, at the extreme, if there's, uh, abuse then then yes then okay then then we're, yeah, we're ta not talking about that we're not talking right? abuse no, no we're talking your normal run of the mill yeah. um which is the majority of relationships mm -hmm. yes <laughs> totally imperfect flawed human beings that are trying our best mm -hmm. and this idea of i think what each of us really craves is um having those hard hurtful parts of us loved and that's what I feel like is, or, or at least not um, continually, you know, picked on. And it's like, most of us are self-aware enough to know where our shortcomings are, but to be reminded again and again of, of those um, parts of us that are hard that we also probably don't like, mm -hmm. it's like, come on, let's give, let, let's give each other that grace. So yeah, positive illusions. It's really it's and, and I'm going to say for myself too, I'm trying to do this more and more with my team, with my kids, with my husband, even with myself, really noticing and showing appreciation and gratitude, pour it on thick. And I know some of some people will be like, well, come on, isn't that just like saccharine? No, if it comes from the heart, who doesn't yeah. love to be appreciated and to, hey, you know, like uh, Sabrina, I love that cool black jacket thing you got going on there and, you know, your cool bracelets. I mean, and I realize these are kind of superficial, but where we can notice and appreciate positive things. I mean, there's also this idea of the uh, mirror neurons in our brains where when I'm appreciating what my body is getting are the appreciation signals, right? Whether it's going to you or going wherever. And so I feel like it's very much back to we get what we give. And if we give love and appreciation and a little more, um, um, patience and grace when things are going off the rails, but it's also why I talk a lot about meeting people where they are, right? So yes, positive illusions, notice the good, try to overlook the bad, totally makes sense. And yet then people will say, but, but, you know, I need to talk to this thing. This thing is making me crazy. You know, he's not doing the dishes or, you know, he's being really critical or, you know, we're so politically um, at odds or whatever it is. I'm not saying don't, discuss or don't address if anything i think a lot of relationships have failed because it is so much easier to sweep 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 it under the rug sweep it under the rug and this is what i've done in the past too it's like it's swept under the rug and then it becomes uh really problematic and it's like whew, explosion so when i think of of this idea of of really helping people learn how to meet others where they are with the intention of i I care about you. I really care about connection and I'm willing to put, you know, connection kind of, um, 
at the, you know, at the, at the top of my intention, and I'm willing to suspend maybe what I need right now, or am willing to suspend insisting on being understood so that that, so we, we maintain that connection. And, you know, when I think about meeting somebody where they are and saying something with sincerity, like, Hey, what do you really need right now? Or what, what, what do you really want right now? Right. I mean, that sincere question, that sincere energy, it is like balm on a, uh, on a sunburn. Right. And, it, and it's hard to, to stay mad when somebody is really sincerely saying, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you. It's like, Oh, okay. Right. And again, there, there still will often, and you know, certain relationships be things that are, are challenging, but I feel like we, again, we, we each have way more power in our relationships when we set these intentions and use these approaches and these tools. I mean, that it, it, that's where transformation happens. Right. And it, yeah, I can feel great by myself, but where transformation has really happened, where I have felt the most uh, at my best, it has been in where there is something at risk, where there's been conflict and hurt and doubt. And it's like, OK, now we're really seeing each other. OK, game on like that idea. I mean, Maslow was something I just learned recently. I was shocked. I hadn't heard this before. You know, at the top of Maslow's hierarchy was we always thought it was self-actualization but somehow before he died he revised it and it wasn't his revision wasn't self-actualization it was helping others self-actualize and so when i read that and i learned that recently i was like oh yeah now we're talking right i mean it's back to your point a little bit as you know especially for those of us who are leaders and um who have gifts of whatever we have gifts of the idea of saying hey let's Let's bring people along with us. Let's share what we know. Let's self-actualize together. That there's a multiplier effect in that approach and in um, transforming relationships that I think is way undervalued. And I'm really passionate about helping people just understand how much value there is in, you know, and again, showing up differently in our relationships, especially the hard ones. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because I, I don't know who um, created the study and, and did this, so I apologize for not knowing the name. Mm -hmm. um, the personality types of people and how they deal with issues, like one of them mm -hmm. is like the avoidant mm -hmm. uh, person, which it's funny mm -hmm. because they are the ones that are the most successful at running and operating a business, which you mm -hmm. would think, but for me, that was a big problem of mine. You know, mm -hmm. I, in the past, if someone tried to talk to me, I'd just be like, I don't want to do this. I want yeah. nothing to do with this. I just want mm -hmm. to go to work. Can we just focus on work? Like, I don't want to have this conversation. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then what happens is that that creates other problems. So, mm -hmm. so what is really happening there? Why are avoidance, you know, tend to be like, a CEO personality, but at the same time, like if you can learn about relationships, I think it will take your game to a whole different level. Cause that's what I started looking at, you know, what am I actually avoiding? And then like, just do the work. It's really uncomfortable for me, but it allows me to grow a better business. Amen. I mean, you said it, it's, it, it, it really can be a superpower. And I say it's radical and obvious it's hidden in plain sight. And yet I'm with you. Oh my God, I'm a workaholic. I mean, like sincerely, it's not, I used to joke about it. Now it's like, yeah, that's not funny. <laughs> and like, go, 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 just like grind and, and work. And I'm just going to get it done. And, you know, and, and very often um, the idea of, Hey, I, you know, I don't want to um, impose on other people or I just, you know, I'm going to rely on myself. I know what needs to get done. Yeah. I mean, listen, some really successful businesses can, can, and have been made like that, but A, I would say at a huge personal cost and B, I mean, I think you already identified it. The idea of saying, let me, let me see my own blind spots and, and slow down a little bit and, and be willing to play the long game and bring people along with me. Uh, there's a beautiful proverb that I keep hearing. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I feel like that again, there's just this beautiful opportunity for us 
to transform uh, individually and how we teach that. I love uh, Marianne Williams, Williamson's, um, her famous quote about when we shine our brightest, we give permission for others to do so too. And so I just, I think of, a, of that kind of avoidant personality or avoidant attachment as something that came from, you know, generational trauma. Yeah, that childhood. Caused, yeah, that caused people to feel like they got to go solo because it's safer, you know, and again, there's something practical, go faster, go slow. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I can buy that. But the idea of saying, Hey, I'm willing to slow down and be trusting and be vulnerable and how that becomes a multiplying fo force. It absolutely does. Right. With, especially with, with the leader with integrity and vision that I think is how, um, businesses not only become way, you know, way bigger financially and commercially, but when I think about those businesses that just, it's like, you just love them because there is that, that energy, that integrity, that authenticity, you feel it as a team member, you feel it as a shareholder, you feel it as a customer. And I don't know what, you know, you can't put a, probably a financial value on it, but it is extraordinarily value. I mean, it's like I was, I'm listening to Simon Sinek's book about um, the power of why it came out maybe 10, 12 years ago. And he talks about having um, repeat customers versus loyal customers. And it's like your repeat customer, if you're giving them enough value at the right price, well, they'll keep coming back again and again versus your loyal customers that, you know, you can, you can screw up and, you know, things can go wrong, but they're loyal because something in the why of your business, there is, there is enough in that, that is, that, that creates that relationship, you know, and I would say I would be, I, I haven't seen the data, but I would be surprised if those companies that have the most loyal customers whose why is really, really strong, um, if their leadership aren't, I, I'd be really surprised if that leadership didn't have a lot of emotional intelligence. Like, like to me, emotional intelligence is really key if you want to be ultra successful and have an ultra loyal um, uh, customer base. Yeah. And then also what people appreciate is just uh, you as a leader, they're seeing you evolve mm -hmm. and that, that gives people a lot of, I, I don't, I don't know if this is the right word, but it's hope like, okay, they're yeah, hope oh, and permission. I can't even believe that um, mm -hmm. they handled that situation that way. Cause they're seeing an evolved version of you, which is what leadership is. It's a vision. And we're always casting out this vision to our people, to our customers about what our standards are, how we are. So that's why, you know, when, when you write this book and you, you have your podcast, I think it's really important for people, especially in business, like all of business is about people and relationships, but we mm -hmm. don't really put a lot of energy into it. And then we're sacrificing our families' relationships to do well in business. And it's kind of like, it's just all getting backwards. And really what I think we're doing right now in 2024 is we're getting back on track. And that's why it feels so messy for people mm -hmm. right now. So it's just like when you're cleaning out your closet, you know, you start pulling things out and it gets even more messy and you're like, mm -hmm. why did I even touch anything? Right. So when you do the work, you're going to be like, oh my God, I'm getting more problems. This is horrible. Uh -huh. You just keep on going through it. And you know, in, in a year, you're just not the same person. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, if I'm listening to this podcast, Andrea, and I'm saying to myself, okay, I need to do some work. Like, mm -hmm. how can I reach out to you? How can I get in contact with you? What can I do to like grow in my relationships to have me have a better life? Uh, well, I mean, a few things, uh, there is, I mean, as, as my, the, the business that I feel like has been made in my image, it's a publishing business about love and relationships. It's called your tango.com. Uh, and it has quite a bit of my own writing. Of course, my book that you referenced radical acceptance, the secret to happy, lasting love. And then my podcast that drops every Tuesday at 3 PM Eastern time. It's on Spotify, iHeart. Uh, all the major podcast outlets as well. We do a video uh, version on YouTube. So yeah, you can uh, you can get a lot of uh, Andrea Miller, uh, my advice. And then I, you know, social, inst like my Instagram has like 14 people. <laughs> so be my be my 15th person. Uh, I mean, I've just really started to build my social presence, but you know, TikTok, Instagram, um, I'm posting uh, quite a bit these days. 
Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and I think, you know, for people to just do the work, cause it's so worth it. I can speak from personal examples. Like it was the most uncomfortable thing for me to work on for myself, but it makes me feel, I know I'm not the same person. And it's not that I changed. I actually transformed myself. Yes. So, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Love it's it. a big yeah. difference. Yeah. So thank you so much for the work that you do, because for a lot of us, um, that's the beauty of technology. The information is out there, but you have to seek it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like in the podcast, because if we can bring good people to the forefront, um, mm -hmm. that's really important because there's bad information out there and you don't yeah. want to be going to Instagram for relationship tips from a 20 year old living in their mom's basement. I would not sign up for that. Program. Oh yeah. Oh, and there, yeah. And, and there are some others that will be, will give some good information and then couple that with some really bad information. I mean, yeah. uh, my, you know, my kids were asking me about Andrew Tate and I'm like, wait, what? And we, you know, I started going through some of the information that they weren't as familiar with. And I, I, you're right. I mean, I feel like there are some personalities out there that are really dangerous. It's like, there's a lot of good stuff that, you know, you'd say, oh, I agree with that, or that's compelling. And then you dig a little deeper and you go, that is actually dangerous. And it's dehumanizing, especially to women. Um, so yeah, I'm, I appreciate the chance to come and uh, tell you, uh, or share, you know, kind of talk with you and share um, what I'm so, so very, very passionate about. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much.